Welcome everyone, I'm Matthew Ross, the Director of Continuing Education at Longwood Gardens in Kennedy Square. I'm also a National Board Member with Wild Ones. On behalf of the Board, we want to start our evening by thanking you for taking the time out of your schedule to make a point of being here tonight. Before I welcome Doug Tallamy, I wanted to let you know that this is the first in a series of webinars that the National Board is preparing to share with all of you, our cherished members, as well as we hope tonight and in the future, you encourage others to share the message of what you've seen through this recording. You can also share this recording with members within your group that couldn't attend it in person. As a reminder, we do have a series of questions that you submitted before tonight's lecture, and Doug will answer them, time permitting, at the end of the talk. I now have the distinct pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker, Doug Tellamy. In addition to being one of the most influential scientists and native plant advocates of our era, Dr. Tellamy is a lifetime honorary director with Wild Ones, which is a small group of visionaries that are advancing the mission of Wild Ones to promote environmentally sound landscaping practices to preserve biodiversity through the preservation, restoration, and establishment of native plant communities. Dr. Tallamy is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife at the University of Delaware. He's an author of the Silver, Silver Medal from the Garden Writers Association, a classic book that I hope all of you have on your shelves, Bringing Nature Home. It's a life-changing read. He also wrote The Living Landscape with Rick Dark, and tonight he'll be sharing insight from his latest publication, Nature's Best Hope. We want to thank you all for your attention and wish you a great evening with Doug Tallamy. Thank you, Matthew. Um, yeah, we do want to talk about uh, my vision of what, what nature's best hope is, but before we do that, I want to talk about what happened last fall. Uh, at least on the East Coast, but I think it went all the way to the Mississippi, um, from Georgia up to Canada. All the red oaks got together and decided they would make acorns at the same time. That is called a mast, and it was a huge mast. And this is what it looked like. Well, uh, if you're easily entertained like I am, maybe you took one of those acorns and just stared at it. Uh, but you might have been rewarded by seeing a little blemish occur on the side there, which then got bigger and it became obvious that an insect was chewing its way out of that acorn. If you kept watching it, it didn't take long, maybe about a minute, looked like a Pillsbury Doughboy at one point, but finally this insect larva plopped out onto the ground. It's a very dangerous time for, for the larva because everything wants to eat it. It's very high in protein, very high in, in fat, so it's got to get below ground as fast as possible, and that's just what it does. It wriggles and squirms, and in about 30 seconds, it has tunneled beneath the soil. Once it's under the soil, it makes a little, a little uh, cavity uh, and then transforms into a pupa and it stays there for two years. After two years, this is what comes out. It's the acorn weevil. Now, a lot of people think that, that weevils have a very long nose, uh, but that's not a nose at all. That is an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here. Uh, and if this is a female, she uses those mouth parts to chew a hole deep into the center of the acorn. And then she turns around and lays an egg. That egg hatches and the larva goes down to the center where it can develop uh, in relative safety. Uh, well, you might wonder why the acorn weevil is staying underground for two years. It's because it takes red oak acorns two years to completely develop. So it doesn't want to come out before it's got another, another good crop of acorns to uh, develop in. But that, of course, leaves a hole in the acorn. And that hole becomes a very valuable resource to a group of ants called uh, in the genus Temnothorax. There are two or three species that love to live inside the holes made by acorn weevils in vacated acorns. And as soon as they find such a hole, they get very excited and they move the entire colony in, carrying the larvae, they carry the queen, everybody works very hard. And it only takes about 30 minutes to get that colony inside the new acorn. They post a guard at the entrance there so nobody else can come in. And then they'll stay there. That's their new house until the acorn rots. But that takes about, about two years. Well, about this time, my, my wife would say, uh, what's, what's your point? What are you, what are you trying to say here? Uh, and my point is, is what I've made time and time again for the last 10 years. Nature is a series of very specialized relationships. 
millions of them. Now, this is one that occurs in my yard. If you have oak trees, I'm sure it occurs in your, your yard. There are specialized relationships between oak trees and, and blue jays in terms of acorn dispersal, specialized relationships between pileated woodpeckers. Something popping up here. Between pileated woodpeckers and carpenter ants. If you want pileated woodpeckers on your property, you have to have trees that make lots of carpenter ants because that's what they feed their young. I have lost control here. There we go. You won't have very specialized bees like Andrena, Andrena facilii, which only occurs on facilia. It's the only plant that it will use pollen to raise its young. And as a matter of fact, there are a number of specialized uh, relationships between native bees and, and our plants. Your native sunflowers, for example, support about 13 species of bees that, that cannot reproduce any, any other type of, of pollen. And I can go on the rest of the night with these specialized relationships. You can't have platycotus tree hoppers unless you have oak trees. That's the only thing they eat. So again, nature is a series of specialized relationships. Point is, today those relationships and nature itself uh, is, is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we really didn't take Teddy Roosevelt's advice very, very well. Way back in 1908, the state of Arizona was planning to mine the Grand Canyon and Teddy, Teddy was president. He got wind of that and he went to the canyon and, and looked out and with five words, he started the process to create the, the uh, Grand Canyon National Park. He said, leave it as it is. And that's great advice. The problem is of course, that that's not an option for most of the country. There's only about 5% of the, the lower 48 states that's anything close to its original pristine ecological state. So leaving it as it is, um, is, is no longer available to us. And that's because we've logged the country uh, many times uh, over. We've tilled it, we've drained it, we've grazed it, we've paved it or otherwise developed it. We've straightened our rivers and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. We've polluted our skies and changed the atmosphere for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced over 3,300 species of plants, many of which are now aggressively displacing native plant communities in our natural areas. In short, we have carved up nature into a series of, of little habitat fragments that are too small and too isolated from each other to maintain the number of species it takes to run productive ecosystems. And remember, those are the ecosystems that support us humans, we humans, whatever it is. Why have we done that? We've done that because we've thought that our nest, planet Earth, was so big that we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course, we were wrong. And that's why we have uh, headlines like this. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? You've seen this one. North America's lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. Or this one. UN predicts that we're going to lose uh, a million species in the next, possibly in the next 20 years. I could go on, but um, this is not a talk about the, the pox that, that we have delivered upon uh, the environment, unless upon all of our, our houses. It's a talk about the cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll, that'll require small efforts from lots of people, but those small efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return for a minute to this headline. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Uh, well, uh, E.O. Wilson, way back in 1987, told us what it would mean if we were to lose our, our insects. He wrote a, a, a paper in the very first issue of Conservation Biology called The Little Things That Run the World. And his message was, was very clear. He said, life as we know it depends on, on insects. And if we were to lose our insects, a number of nasty things would happen. First of which, the flowering plants. Most of the flowering plants, about 90% would go extinct and that would drastically change energy flow through our, our terrestrial habitats, which would collapse the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, the mammals. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because of the loss of insect decomposers. We'd only have bacteria and fungi to break things down. And of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. The good news is, uh, we can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save most of nature itself. But in order to do that, we're gonna have to change the way we landscape. Why? 
because as, as you know, we humans depend on nature. We depend on functioning ecosystems that produce what we call ecosystem services. One of the services we get from plants, well, there's a whole big long list of them, but we'll go over some of the important ones. How about oxygen? That's pretty important. Um, cleaning our water, slowing its journey to the, the salty ocean where we really can't use it anymore. Capturing carbon, one of the most important ecosystem services today, and then pumping a lot of that carbon into the ground. Our soils can, can store, uh, what is it, seven times the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere right now, but we have to get it into the soil and it's plants that are doing that as long as we have them in our, in our landscapes. Plants also build topsoil, they hold it in place. You know, if there were no plants, all the topsoil would be in the ocean, we'd have nothing but rocky surfaces. They prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, they do all kinds of things. What do animals do for those plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of them. At least the flowering plants, they disperse plant seeds, and of course, many other things. Point is, designing landscapes that destroy the production of those ecosystem services is simply not an option. It never was a good option, but today, with so many humans on the planet, it's not an option at all. Well, there have been, been people through the, the years have recognized that uh, and written about it, and uh, anybody in Wild Ones certainly knows that Ella Leopold was, was uh, one of the best visionaries we've, we've ever had. Uh, commonly referred to as the father of modern conservation. And uh, he said lots of important things, but one, one of the things he said was the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Uh, and, and we've been terrible at that, particularly the, the extractive capitalistic Western societies. Um, we've just gobble up the earth as if it were infinite. Well, Alamo had a dream. Uh, he wanted to develop to develop uh, a relationship with uh, the land that he called a land ethic. He recognized that we needed to use the resources on the planet. We needed to farm, we needed to lumber and graze and mine and hunt, but he wanted us to learn how to do it without destroying local ecosystems. That was his vision of a land ethic. What has always been curious to me is that Aldo never wrote about developing a land ethic where we actually lived. It was always it was always someplace else, and I'm not sure why that was, uh, but I'm guessing that the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist was so deeply embedded in Aldo's culture and our culture today that he didn't recognize it as an option at all. Well, I'm going to argue tonight that um, living with nature uh, is an option. As a matter of fact, I'm going to argue it is the only viable option that is is left to us. We absolutely have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes because let's face it, there's a lot of human dominated landscapes. We are practically everywhere. So where shall we start? Let's start with privately owned land. Um, east of the Mississippi, most of the land is privately owned. About almost 86% of the land is, is privately owned. Uh, if we were to ignore conservation on private property, we would be destined to failure. There'd only be about 15% of the land to fool with. That is not nearly enough. You'd have that fragmented uh, series of, of little parks and preserves, not nearly enough to, to uh, sustain nature. So privately owned land is going to be an important component of the future of conservation. But there's lots of other areas that we never think of as options for conservation. How about uh, the, the land that's now in power and pipeline rights of ways 21 million acres, railroad rights of ways, another 3 million acres, uh, golf courses, 2 million acres, airports. You know, the, the Denver airport is twice the size of, of Manhattan. They're huge areas. Then we have all the places that we live, our, our rural and suburban and exurban and urban, urban centers, lots of land there. Road size, we got 4 million miles of roads and there's two sides to every one of those, those roads. All of those areas could be landscaped in a way that promotes conservation. And just with these areas here, we're talking about 599 million acres. How big is 599 million acres? It's, it's huge. It's the size of Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, plus Oklahoma and Montana and California and Texas, all added up together. So not having a place to do conservation is not our problem. We can do conservation just about everywhere. What is it we're trying to conserve? I'm sorry about these yellow lines. I don't know if you guys can see that, but um, they're appearing. I don't know why. 
we need to, what we're trying to do is rebuild nature, um, but all components of nature are not equally important in, in helping it to, to thrive. There are some species that contribute a lot more to ecosystem function than other species. So let's start with them. And one of the most important components of nature are the food webs that support uh, the life, you know, of, of, of the animals that are in our ecosystems. Uh, and it turns out that caterpillars are essential for sustaining those, those food webs, at least terrestrial food webs. Why is that? Because caterpillars transfer more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we're going to have successful conservation in terrestrial habitats, we need caterpillars. Uh, now, many of you have heard me talk about uh, Carolina chickadees. I'll just use them briefly as an example. Uh, they are seed eaters during the winter, but when they're reproducing, they have to switch to caterpillars because their young cannot eat seeds. And that is true for most of the birds that are out there. Not only are they rearing their young on insects, they're rearing them on caterpillars. We actually have data to support that. Um, this is work from my uh, student, Ashley Kennedy, uh, who uh, did a citizen science project looking at uh, the nestling, the, the, the diet composition, composition for uh, nestling diets. Um, she had people from all over the country send in uh, photos of birds bringing picture, bringing insects to the nest. Uh, she then identified what those, those insects and arthropods were. Uh, so you're looking at the results for 20 families of birds. Uh, and the, I'll just make it simple for you. The green bars uh, are the percentage of the nestling diet in each one of these 20 families that um, are, are lepidopter, are caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 bird families, caterpillars dominate the nestling diet. So imagine what would happen to all of those birds if we were to lose the caterpillars in our, our landscapes. Which means there's something special about caterpillars. Let's talk briefly uh, about why caterpillars are so important to birds. Um, one reason is that they are relatively soft prey items. So if you think of this, this caterpillar as uh, a sausage with a very thin wrapper, the thin wrapper is the exoskeleton. It's undigestible, so you don't want a lot of that. And then inside, it's, it's stuffed with lots of good things. Plus, if it's soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your offspring without fear of injuring it. Uh, and if you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, uh, they're pretty rough. They just, they really do stuff it down uh, like a plunger. Um, caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. Uh, one medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass, the weight of 200 aphids. Now, some of our smaller birds do chase aphids, but do you want to chase 200 aphids or find one caterpillar? They're nutritious. They're very high in fat, very high in protein, exactly what baby birds need. Uh, and they're very low in, in that exoskeleton, that percentage of chitin compared to other insects like beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. There are lots of exoskeleton. They also have um, sharp edges. So they're simply not as good a source of, of food. And it turns out the caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds, particularly during the breeding season. Now I mentioned carotenoids, um, not because I love organic chemistry, but because I am a, a vertebrate and vertebrates don't make carotenoids, which means I have to get them from the only source that does make them and that is plants. Uh, I, I believe you are vertebrates too, birds are vertebrates. We all have to get our carotenoids from plants and we need to because they are essential components of our diet. And that's why my wife Cindy says that I have to eat my, I have to eat my carrots to get my beta carotene and my, my tomato to get my lycopene and my whatever that is to get my, my lutein. And she makes sure I, I get all of these things because they stimulate my immune system. And there is no better time to have a strong immune system than, than right now. They are antioxidants. They run around our body and protect our, our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, uh, eat your carrots, you will see better. She, she was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about primarily uh, male birds, like this prothonotary warbler. He is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutein's. And he's taken those lutein's and made pigments out of them and put them in his feathers. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. So those are good things. Uh, well, birds, uh, particularly during the breeding season, are not eating plants. So they've got to get their carotenoids from the prey items that they do eat. 
And this is the distribution of carotenoids across different uh, nestling prey items. The important point here is that it is not equal. The first two bars are different types of caterpillars and they have far more carotenoids than other types of, of bird prey. The third bar is our orthopteroids, things like uh, crickets and katydids and grasshoppers. This middle bar here, my arrow keeps disappearing. There we go. The butterflies, the adult moths and butterflies of the caterpillars have far fewer ca uh, carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. It's the caterpillars that eat green leaves. Uh, and way over here is, is the earthworm. The early bird gets the worm, but it does not get any, any carotenoids. Does this matter in prey choice? Uh, well, yes. Um, Ashley did a study with bluebirds Using GoPro cam uh, cameras, she put GoPro cameras on the roofs of bluebird boxes and those cameras took a picture once every second. And she had a lot of cameras and she had a lot of bluebird boxes and she did it for three years. Um, so she ended up with 7,628 pictures of birds, of bluebirds bringing in prey items. And those pictures were good enough that she could identify what the prey item was. Uh, and what she found is there's a very good relationship between the frequency with which the prey item is brought to the nest and the amount of carotenoids in that prey item. They eat caterpillars the most, followed by those orthopterans, followed by uh, a bunch of, of things with less carotenoids in them, fewer carotenoids in the, the uh, other end of the spectrum. So it really does look like birds are picking their prey, at least in part based on how many carotenoids are in them. What does that mean? Well, uh, it, it, it's looking like caterpillars are not optional components of, of bird diets. They are essential components of bird diets. Uh, how many caterpillars are we talking about here? Well, that's another important part of the story. There you go. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadees? We've got good data for chickadees, but there's good data for lots of birds. And the answer is it takes thousands, six to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of, of tiny birds like a chickadee, depending on the number of, of uh, nestlings in, in the nest. Uh, and that's just to get to the point where they, where they leave the nest. They continue to be fed uh, by the parents for another 24 days before they're independent and they're fed caterpillars. So we're talking about thousands and thousands of caterpillars in the landscape if you want breeding birds. And that means we've got to build landscapes for caterpillars. And we have never done that. We've never thought about that. As a matter of fact, we have only focused on building landscapes that have no insects at all because we thought that they were, they were bad. So how do we do that? Well, we add caterpillars to landscapes by adding the plants that, that make them. There is a catch, and that is that all plants don't make caterpillars equally. There are lots of caterpillars that only eat particular plants. And that means you can't leave those plants out of your landscape if you, you want those caterpillars. And the, nothing illustrates it better than the monarch butterfly. If you want monarchs, you've got to have milkweeds. Putting crepe myrtles in your yard is not gonna make any monarchs. Um, and the reason is that, that we've got what, what we call host plant specialization is extremely common among insect herbivores, particularly caterpillars. Why is that? Well, you know, many of you heard me tell this story, but it's an essential part of the story, so we have to tell it again. Plants defend themselves from insects. They don't want to be eaten, so they load their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And if you don't believe me, after I finish tonight, go out and eat a leaf and see if you like it. You're not going to like it because all plants are protected chemically. Uh, and it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green outside. It's not because there are no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat them. They are too well protected chemically. There is a reason that it's hard to get our kids to eat vegetables. They inherently know that they're toxic. Yes, I'm kidding, but only a little bit. All right. We do know that insects eat plants though, despite all these defenses. So how do they, how do, they do that? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. About 90% of the insects that eat plants can only eat the plants with which they have a, an evolutionary relationship. In other words, they've been exposed to these plant lineages for eons during which they have developed uh, the enzymes 
that can store and, and excrete and detoxify the compounds that are protecting a particular plant lineage, the behavioral adaptations, the life history adaptations that allow them to eat particular plant lineages without dying. But they can't do that for all the plants, so they focus on, on very few types of, of plants, and that's the specialization that we're talking about. All this boils down to, to uh, one point, and that is plant choice matters. If you take one piece of information away from this talk, it should be this. Plant choice matters. If you want to create healthy landscapes, you've got to pick the plants that do that. And I'm going to give you uh, some examples of how it actually works, trying to prove that it does work. I'm going to start with, with our house in Oxford, Pennsylvania. We have 10 acres. Uh, it was mowed for hay. Actually, it was in, it's been in agriculture for uh, over 300 years. So exhausted soil, mowed for hay when we moved in. As a matter of fact, um, <laughs> it was loaded with, with uh, invasive plants, multiflora rose and oriole and bittersweet. Autumn olive, Japanese honeysuckle, that's my wife Cindy getting ready to, to clear it all out. While she was clearing out the, the 10 acres, and by the way, if you say, oh, that's impossible, it's not impossible. She's, she's kind of skinny there, but she was able to do it. Um, but it is work. While she was working hard, I was putting some plants back. Uh, and I like to take pictures of caterpillars. So I put the plants that make caterpillars that I want to take pictures of. Uh, and, you know, part of it was to see whether I actually could bring insects to our yard that weren't there before by putting in plants that weren't there before. They should be there, but, but they had been long gone. And one of the ones I wanted was the Canadian outlet. Uh, that's what it looks like as an adult, looks like a leaf. Well, in order to, to do that, I needed meadow root. That is the only thing it eats. I, I did, I planted meadow root, grew very, very uh, well, but I didn't know. I thought, it, I thought it would be years before that particular caterpillar found uh, my little patch of, of uh, meadow rue. So I planted it, it grew. I didn't even look at it for a month. I went out and it was almost defoliated because it had so many Canadian outlets on it. That worked really fast. And now I have a healthy population of meadow rue and Canadian outlets. Same story for uh, goldenrod stowaway. That's a misnomer. This, this beautiful yellow moth here uh, is, has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's actually a specialist on Biden's Aristosa, ditch daisy. I planted Biden's Aristosa. It took a year for me to get the uh, goldenrod stowaway, but now I have a, a good population of them and the Bidens. And this is how we're getting the plants back onto our beleaguered piece of land. I wanted Hackberry Emperor and it's, it's beautiful adult, or maybe not so beautiful, but it's a butterfly that should be there. But they eat hackberry. We didn't have any hackberry, so I planted several hackberry trees. Uh, we now have a thriving population of, of hackberry emperor. As a matter of fact, it wasn't long ago I went, went out um, actually at night with my flashlight. I looked at one branch of uh, one hackberry tree and there were nine hackberry emperor caterpillars on it. So good population. I did not plant goldenrod. It came in on its own and along with it came uh, many of the things that specialize on goldenrod. Goldenrod, by the way, supports 110 species of, of caterpillars where I live. Things like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the goldenrod gall moth, goldenrod flower moth. Now, I don't actually have this one yet. I've been waiting for it. It ought to be there, but it's very localized, has not found our, our property yet. And this is the 20th year that we've, we've been there. Uh, so this is anticipation. Uh, it's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the out of the bottle. I go out ev every year uh, in early August and look for the golden red flower moth. And one of these days, I'm going to find it. That's what its caterpillar looks like. Planted Virginia creeper because I wanted Pandora sphinx because it's another beautiful caterpillar and I wanted to take its picture. Yes, Virginia creeper. It is not a horrible plant. It's a really productive plant and it won't bring down your your trees and it's got good good fall cover. And it's got a beautiful adult. And, but when I put in Virginia creeper, I got lots of things I didn't even know were associated with Virginia creeper, like the lettered sphinx moth, the hog sphinx, also called the Virginia uh, creeper sphinx, uh, and Abbott sphinx. Now this was one I was waiting for, for 20 years. This spring, I, I got it. Uh, so no more anticipation there. Wanted the zebra swallowtail because I think it's the prettiest of our swallowtails, but it's a specialist on pawpaw. We planted pawpaw um, long before I got the zebra swallowtail because it took nine years, the pawpaw sphinx came. I didn't even know there was a pawpaw sphinx. And we got a lot of pawpaws. And I also planted lots of oaks. Now these are just examples because I planted a lot of things, 
Um, this is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. People argue about whether it's uh, uh, 300 years old or 400 years old or 500 years old. Um, well, of course, none of the, the oaks on my property are that, that old, but they still immediately started to bring in uh, important moths like the solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow-shouldered slug caterpillar, the uh, orange-headed epicolema, the red-washed caterpillar, the yellow-vested moth, the orange-tufted uh, oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two-spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red-humped oak worm, the orange-humped oak worm, the pink-striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown eucalyptus, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species have come to the oaks that we put on our property. And it didn't take long. This, I took this picture last year. This is a crocus geometer uh, eating a seedling um, pin oak. First year that it's up, look, it's standing on the ground here, but it's still eating it. So you do not need 300 year old oaks before they're productive. Now, this is what our yard looks like uh, today, taken from the same perspective that I took that other picture. We do have lawn, I'm very traditional, but we put in a lot of plants. And those plants have each brought the, the specialized uh, relationships um, with them. I'm counting the number of species of, of moths at our, on our property, and I'm up to 966. Those are the ones that I have taken pictures of. 966 species of moths. It'll probably top out somewhere around a thousand, getting fewer of them when I go out, but um, that's a lot of species. And because we have all of that bird food, we have documented 55 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. It works, it works. But do you need 10 acres for it to work? Oh, that's a good question. Most people don't have 10 acres. A lot of people live in, in suburbia, for example. Well, let's go to uh, Margie and Dan Terpstra in uh, Kirkwood, Missouri. This is their house. I visited them this, this spring. They are nestled in a very typical neighborhood. They have uh, 0.6 acres, which was loaded with bush honeysuckle. That's the common uh, invasive plant out in, uh, in Missouri. And what they did was get rid of that, put in a lot of native plants and a water feature. Uh, it's very attractive to birds. Um, they call it a bubbler. And they have recorded 149 species of birds uh, in their yard, including 35 warbler species. Now at my house, we only recorded eight. So that gives you a comparison. We've got 10 acres, they've got 0.6. It really works, it really works. Can it work in an urban yard? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house uh, in, uh, in Chicago. Pam, Pam's property is adjacent to one of the runways on in O'Hare Airport. I mean, she is really in, in Chicago and it's a tiny property, one tenth of an acre. That's three times smaller than the average lot size in, in the US. She did the same thing. She, she took out her invasive plants, put in a little water feature. She added 60 species of native plants. There's absolutely no connectivity with any type of preserved land. She is surrounded by, by urban um, non-habitats right next to Kennedy's Chicago Express, Expressway. Yet she sits in her backyard and she enjoys the birds that come. 116 species so far have used her yard, including a woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, go to Chicago and visit, visit Pam, you can see one. Well, what about in, in city centers? You know, more and more of us, 82% now live in, in uh, cities. Can we bring nature back to cities? That's a good question. Way back in, in uh, what, 2014, I was staring at this plant, uh, this, this butterfly weed, which reminds me, we have a marketing issue with our, our native plants. We call them weeds. And we shouldn't call them weeds because a weed is a plant out of place. Butterfly weed is not out of place. Uh, it is a plant that belongs there. Um, so so let's, let's be nicer. You know, weed, people want to, okay, that gives you permission to, to uh, pull it out and spray it. We're going to call this Monarch's Delight at this point. This is a, a good uh, milkweed, beautiful milkweed. So I was staring at it in 2014, uh, and the first thing I saw was this megachylid bee. I know it's a megachylid bee because it carries its, its pollen on its tummy and not on its legs. And it was sipping nectar from, from uh, Monarch's Delight. Well, this bee has very specific requirements. It is not going to be there unless it also has soft, pliable leaves, like the leaves on redbud, 
but there was a red bud there. What they do is they carve the edges out of those leaves uh, and that's what they, they put their pollen in. They gather pollen and then, then roll it up in the, the uh, soft leaf tissue and then lay an egg on. They stuff it in a hole and that's how they reproduce. Um, so redbud was there and because redbud was there you now have early season foraging for queen bumblebee so there were bumblebee colonies there as well. But then I saw a monarch. Now this was 2014. It was at one of the lowest points of the, the monarch population in the east. Monarchs were in big, big trouble and this was June. We don't usually see monarchs in June even in, in good years but uh, I saw that monarch and then there was another one. I saw two monarchs and they were at Monarch's Delight here. There was another uh, type of milkweed there as well. Uh, and again, they were there because they had the resource that they needed. They had uh, nectar, they had milkweeds and they were gonna lay eggs on them. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in Manhattan. And this is the strip of native plants that I'm talking about. And they're not even all, all native. A lot of them are, but, but uh, some of them aren't. And there's the, there's the monarch's delight. So, you know, we don't think of, of Manhattan as great habitat for, for um, rebuilding nature. But if, if thoughtful native planting is using the plants that actually bring, uh, that support uh, a lot of the, the creatures we're talking about, can be done in the middle of Manhattan, then we can do it anywhere. I am convinced we can do it anywhere. There are four keys to success though, wherever we try this. And the first one has got to be, uh, we have to shrink the area that we have in lawn. We have over 40 million acres of lawn in the US. Actually the figure that's, that's an old figure. I, nobody's measured it recently, but I'm sure it's much, much higher than that. That is an area bigger than New England. Uh, and of course this is not productive habitat. This is destroying productive habit. It might be pretty, but particularly with the, the fertilizers and pesticides we put on lawn, uh, it's not gonna be part of our conservation future. So I'm suggesting that we cut that area in half, which would give us 20 million acres to, to work with. If we restore that 20 million acres, put those, those uh, plants that are, that are supporting all those specialists back into 20 million acres, we can uh, build what I'm gonna call homegrown national park in the US, 20 million acres. We're doing it at home, so we can call it Homegrown National Park. And that's bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all those parks, still less than, than 20 million acres. What are the benefits of building a park at home? There are a number of, of benefits, um, and these are just a few of them. Um, personal benefits, you can develop a personal relationship with nature at your own pace, your own time, um, and you can do it by avoiding crowds. You don't have to drive anywhere anymore. It's free, and by the way, when you have a pandemic, it's always open, it's never closed. You can avoid all the, the travel hassles. You know, when you go to a, a national park, a real national park, you're dealing with millions of people and you, you've done it. You know what sitting in the line is, is like. You get to experience the natural world alone. You know, today we're all concerned about uh, exposing our kids to, to nature and we should be. Uh, so in, in so many cases, what we do is put them on a bus and drive them to a, a nature preserve. Uh, 30 kids on a bus with a teacher, they get out and they walk around. The teacher tells them not to touch anything. They walk around for an hour, get back in the bus and, and drive back to the, to the city. That's better than nothing, but it's not that personal experience that we're talking about. And you get to hunt lizards if you build a park at home. And I learned that from my granddaughter, Zoe, uh, who sent me this picture. She is hunting lizards and this is how you do it. First, you disguise yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards do not see you coming and you crawl very slowly uh, so the lizards don't run away. Uh, you can wear your best dress, uh, it doesn't matter. And believe me, she's deadly serious. Um, she lives in Hawaii. Her, her bit of nature is about 10 feet by 10 feet uh, surrounded by some, some shrubs and the lizards she's hunting are little, little anoles. But um, this is a game that she invented herself. And believe me, uh, when she's an adult, she will remember hunting lizards in her little patch of, of nature. Uh, if you want to do more than hunt lizards, lizards, check out this book called Nature Play at Home by Nancy Stranisti and a number of, of really uh, great activities, uh, many of them very easy to pull off um, right in, in your yard.
Okay, second important thing we need to think about is um, using keystone plants. As a matter of fact, they're essential to successful restoration. What, what is a keystone plant? One thing we have learned recently is that all native plants are not created equal. Um, they, some of them support a lot more, um, a lot more insects, a lot more caterpillars than, than others, and that dries food webs a lot better. As a matter of fact, just 5% of our native plants are making about 75% of the caterpillar food that drives these, these food webs. So if we don't use that 5%, uh, we only get about 25% of the food that we actually need. So the question is no longer simply, uh, are, are native plants better than non-natives? Uh, we know that they are uh, on, on average. There's, there's, it's just not a question anymore. The question really is, um, do we want ecologically productive plants in our landscapes? Or do we want ecologically benign plants or even destructive plants? And that's, that's kind of a no-brainer. No Yet, I still get emails um, a couple times a year from somebody saying, don't I know that, that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from, from Asia, grew in North America some 7 million years ago? That makes them native to North America, and therefore, um, we should be planting them. Well, this is not our metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or, or not. It's whether they're productive or not. Ginkgos produce zero caterpillars. That's what ginkgos look like. If you ever find a caterpillar in a ginkgo, take a picture of it and send it to me. You'll be the first. Um, so, you know, if we want to restore nature, ginkgo is, is not going to do it. Compared to oaks, where, where I live, the, the mid-Atlantic states, uh, they support 557 species of caterpillars. Uh, over the entire nation, it's over 900 species. This is the most uh, productive genus of plants that we know about um, so far. Just an example of a keystone plant. And let me give you uh, an example from my yard of the power of keystone plants, the keystone oaks. Remember, I have recorded 966 species of, of moths in my yard. 966 species of bird food. Uh, of those 966 species, 845 have known host plants. Uh, so there's a bunch, we don't know what they, what they eat, so we can't talk about them. But out of the ones we do know, the 845, we know what they eat, 255 of them use oaks. Now we have 59 genera of native woody plants on our property. Only one of them is Quercus the oaks. And we have hundreds of, of genera of herbaceous plants. So all this boils down to this. Oaks represent less than 2% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity. But they support at least 30% of our moss species. That's what a keystone plant does. Imagine what, would, what the, the number of moss species on my yard would be if I didn't have any oaks. Uh, so what are the keystone species? How do you find out where they are? Go to Native Plant Finder in the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the top ranked plants for your county, wherever you are in the country will, will pop up. Um, so these are the most common uh, uh, um, keystone plants in, in uh, so many places. So uh, notice I say native oaks, native cherries, native willows, native birches. I say that because you can go to the, the nursery and buy non-native oaks. I don't know why you do that. We have over 90 species of native oaks, uh, but you can go get uh, Chinese oak and, and English oak and some other things. Uh, same thing with cherries, same thing with, with willows and, and birches. So focus on the native species. The herbaceous ones, goldenrod is always, always uh, way up there. Native asters, sunflowers, um, believe it or not, nightshades, various solanum native strawberries, and the list goes on and on, but you have a, the, the old excuse of I don't know what to plant to support wildlife is gone. We do know what to plant at this point. Point three, keystone plants work really well unless you have a lot of lights around, unless there's a ton of light pollution, and that's because light pollution kills insects. Lights are attracted, or insects are attracted to lights, particularly those, those moths that are so vital to our, our food webs. Uh, and, and these are all the nasty things that happen. They die from exhaustion, they die from colliding with the, the light bulb, being incinerated by it, dehydration. Predators know to go to lights to pick off the, uh, the insects. That includes bats and other insects. It blinds them. It, and then it misdirects a lot of things that they need to be doing, like where they're gonna lay their eggs, their circadian rhythms, their foraging, their mating, their reproduction. Uh, it's turning out that light pollution around the world is one of the major causes of, of insect decline globally. 
So how do we reduce this? Well, fortunately, this is one of the easiest ways, easiest things that we can fix. We could put security lights or put motion sensors on, put security lights on a motion sensor, put a motion sensor on a security light. How about that? Um, if you're worried about the bad man coming and that's why you have a light on, put on that, that motion sensor. So it only turns on when the bad man comes. And the first thing you're gonna notice is that the bad man doesn't come very, very often. Uh, if you don't wanna go the motion sensor route, then replace that white light with a yellow light because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to, to insects. And the least attractive of all are um, yellow LED lights. If we were to replace our, our outdoor lighting with yellow LED lights, overnight we could save billions of, of insects during the, the season. And you know, really, this is easy to do. Fourth point we need to think about, another thing we've just started thinking about is, is we have these plants, many of the most powerful ones are trees and they're making caterpillars, but many of those caterpillars do not complete their development on the tree and we have to allow them to do that or it doesn't work. Let me give you an example. This is, this is um, well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, and there are 511 species of caterpillars that develop on oaks in Chester County, Pennsylvania. A few of them complete their life cycle on the tree, like the polyphemus moth. It eats the, the oak leaves, uh, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from the, the branch. Uh, if it's the fall, it overwinters as a cocoon, then it emerges as an adult. Everything happens on the tree. And I wish all of the, the moths did that, but they don't. 94% of them, 480 species, drop from the tree and they pupate in the soil, they tunnel into the soil and pupate, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that is under the tree. And you know where I'm going with this. This is what it looks like under the tree. There is no leaf litter and the soil is compacted and mowed. Uh, it's no man's land for any caterpillar that drops out of these trees. So survivorship is going to be um, non-existent or, or very low because of the way we landscape under so many of our, our plantings. And of course the cement landscape is, is even less favorable to, to caterpillars. This is what we typically do. We have to have a tree in, in a yard and nobody's measured what the survivorship of, of caterpillars in a situation like this is, but I guarantee it is much higher in a situation like this, where you have a tree, then you've got a layered landscape, you've got some native azaleas and ferns and ground covers. This is where you do your fancy spring ephemeral gardening because you're not gonna go tramping through that. You're not gonna, you're not gonna squish the caterpillars. You're not gonna mow it. You're not gonna compact the soil. It's very easy for them to tunnel in. Um, or you put your, your uh, ground covers there, your, your uh, native pack of sandra, your may apples, your wild ginger, all kinds of ground covers. It becomes a very safe site for, for those developing caterpillars. We need to do that everywhere. Another important point is that um, we've learned there's room for compromise. And this, this is a really important point. This is, comes from the research of, of my other uh, PhD student, recent PhD student, Desiree Narango. She's now doing a, a postdoc up in Massachusetts. She compared chickadee reproductive success uh, in, in landscapes dominated by native plants. This is in uh, the suburbs of Washington, DC, inside the Beltway. She compared, uh, uh, landscapes dominated by native plants with yards that were dominated by introduced plants. None of the landscapes were 100% native, um, some were 100% introduced. And what she found is when they were dominated by introduced plants, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars, so 75% less bird food for those chickadees. Those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. She had boxes up and the chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough to eat here, we're not even gonna try. If they did try, the nests can contain 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to, to uh, make it to maturity. They just didn't survive. If they did survive, they produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to, to do that. And you might say, well, those aren't giant differences, but when you put all that together in a population growth model, this is what you get. As a function of the percentage of non-native plants in the landscape from no, none to 100% non-native plants. The dotted line is replacement rate. That is the rate at which uh, the population has to reproduce in order to replace the adults that die every year. Uh, if you reproduce at, at the level of replacement rate, you have a stable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. Uh, if you reproduce above 
that line, you have a growing population, but if you're making fewer babies than you need for replacement, you have a shrinking population, an unsustainable population. This is where those, those lines overlap. So conservatively speaking, you can have up to 30% non-native plants. In other words, if 70% of the plant biomass in your yard is, is native, um, you can have a, a uh, sustainable population of breeding birds. So this is, this is good news for two reasons. First of all, this is the first time this has been measured for any bird anywhere. For, so anybody who's doubting whether their plant choice actually impacts more than caterpillars, it impacts the things that eat those caterpillars, this data set ought to, ought to convince them. But also it suggests there is room for compromise. Uh, and I think that's really important because if my message was you can't have any na uh, non-native plants at all, my audiences would be really small because we love them. People love those, those beautiful plants and they're just not willing to give them all up. But look, you can have some, you can have your crepe myrtle as long as it's not dominating your landscape. You can even have your ginkgo as long as it's not dominating your landscape. So compromise is a good thing. Can native plants be used in formal designs? Of course they can. Our native plants are used in formal designs in, in Europe all the time. I guess that's okay because in Europe they're, they're not native. Um, somebody sent me this, this picture and I'm really bad at tracking who sends me emails, but this, this was recent, just a couple of months ago. That the manager of this garden somewhere here in the US and what he's doing is sneaking native plants into the landscape without telling anybody. Uh, and his goal is to make it entirely native and maintain the formal design just to show that you can, you can do it. And I, wanna, I can't wait to see the, the end uh, picture of that. Can we get a, a uh, pollinator garden into this standard suburban lot without it looking crazy? Sure we can, we just put a fence around it. Um, that, I don't know, that formalizes it, it makes it okay. Of course it's beautiful, it's functional, it's not very big, but that's okay, especially if everybody did it. Here's another one, there's no fence around it, but it still has a level of formality, really functional, and it's certainly a lot more productive than this grass uh, around it. Heather Holm, um, uh, she's gonna be speaking to you in an uh, upcoming webinar, sent me this picture. This is part of her yard, a before and after picture, just putting in the plants that help the bees she's gonna talk about as opposed to cement and, and grass. Can municipalities help us live with, with nature? Of course they can. And you know what? It's starting to happen. It's really encouraging. You probably heard about the, the Minnesota program. They have a cost sharing program to encourage homeowners to replace uh, all or part of their lawn with prairie and they'll help you pay for it. Uh, there, there are places in Florida that are paying residents to allow the burrowing owl, a listed species, to burrow in their front lawns. If you have a burrowing owl, we're gonna pay you. That's the way the Endangered Species Act ought to be written. You ought to get a reward for protecting endangered species instead of a punishment. Missouri has a, uh, or at least they recently had a, um, it's kind of a bounty on calorie pears, on Bradford pears. If you brought in the body of a pear, they gave you a free replacement tray, very good deal. And you've probably heard about the, the uh, lawn reduction programs. You get rebates in California and I think some parts of, of Arizona uh, to take that thirsty lawn out of your landscape and replace it with a, a xeric planting of, of uh, natives. So it can be done. We've made uh, what I consider to be three missteps in the early years of conservation. And by early years, I mean the last century. The first is we have assumed that nature's important. We want it, but it's not essential which means it always takes a back seat. I was at the Cincinnati Zoo not too long ago and they have this well-sized poster there and I've seen uh, posters like this and, and just this attitude almost everywhere. We need to save wildlife for future generations so they can appreciate the wild things that are, that are on this planet. And I, I get that, but it suggests that nature's there just for entertainment. It's much more important than that. We need to save wildlife. We need to save nature and functioning ecosystems so that we have future generations. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we've talked about this, but by, by restricting conservation efforts just to the places where humans aren't, we've condemned them to, to failure because those areas again are too small, too isolated from each other to, to um, sustain life in the long run. David Quammen has this excellent analogy between ecosystems and a Persian rug. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 
Persian rugs. It's 71 rug fragments, none of which are functioning as a Persian rug. And that's what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that terminology because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every inch of the Earth has ecological significance, including your yard. So what we need to do, since we're living in between these habitat fragments that we've, we've carved up, is put the plants back particularly those keystone plants, and then as much diversity as we can so that we can create viable habitat in between those habitat fragments. They're now connected, not just as biological carters where plants and animals can move back and forth, but as viable habitat where plants and animals can actually live. Um, that's easy. We just plant plants. We plant the right plants. Our third misstep was to leave earth stewardship to a few specialists ecologists, conservation biologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. And I don't know why, because everybody on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why, why most people should get a pass and not have to think about Earth stewardship is beyond me. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you really can save it where you live. I like this approach because it empowers each one of us. Um, and and that's, that's good because so many people are feeling helpless. We've got tremendous uh, environmental problems out there. If I said to you, I want you to, um, to contribute to climate change tomorrow and I wanna see the results tomorrow, you could stop driving your SUV, but nobody'd be able to measure the results. We don't get that positive feedback. But if you go out and you plant that oak tree, you plant a cherry, you plant a, a, a pocket prairie, um, we can see the results. We can see it almost immediately. And that makes you an important component of the future of conservation. You now are empowered to actually solve the problem. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire Earth's problem. You get overwhelmed immediately. Just worry about your little piece of planet Earth. If you own property, get rid of the invasive species, put in some, some, some pollinator habitat, reduce the area you have in lawn, and use those keystone plants, and, and uh, we will all be, be uh, well, we'll be 85% done. If you don't own property, don't, don't give up. Be a volunteer on some piece of property that, that needs this help. This is not labor-free, folks. This, this is a lot of work. So um, any of you who live in a city and don't have a lot of property, you can help help uh, somebody who does have property. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is gonna determine nature's face. So what I'm saying is, and what my grandchildren here are, are agreeing with is you are nature's best hope. Thanks very much. I'm done, Matt. Sorry, Doug. Hang on one second. This All is right. serious. Thank you very much, Doug. Okay, uh, good. A little delay there. Um, I thought maybe you went home or something. No, no, no. <laughs> right here at Longwood Gardens, we're watching a, a corpse flower to see if it's going to be blooming here. So. Oh, <laughs> you did go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to first off thank you, Doug, for your your graciousness uh, by by sharing your evening with us and really en enlightening our audience for those that uh, needed a little bit of inspiration at this time. And uh, there were a couple questions that we had that were prepared in advance. So the very first one was from Chase Davies in Minnesota, and he asked, "Is it pretty obvious? It, it is pretty obvious that multiple gardens in a neighborhood community are better than one single garden." that is widely dispersed. Not all gardens will have persistent or consistent bloom times. So what would you suggest for starting a conversation that hopefully would lead toward a loosely coordinated neighborhood effort? Okay, there, there are several points in there. Um, first of all, the assumption that a, a small effort is not gonna be as good as a big effort, that's, that's almost certainly correct, but it doesn't mean the small effort is, is useless. So a small little property that is surrounded by people who are not, not uh, playing this game still will contribute to the greater population of the things that you're trying to protect. 
we're actually starting research on, on this. And one of the things we're finding is that even isolated plants, and they can be isolated by good distances, do support the, the populations of the insects that use those plants, which means they're in a matrix that uh, includes the entire dispersal range of those, those insects. And that's why the high line is attracting insects. So, so those isolated patches of habitat are contributing to the well-being of, of the populations that we're trying to help. So don't give up on those. Um, but you know, the main part of your question is how do we convince our neighbors to, to join in as well? Um, yeah, I, that, you know, that's why I've been writing books. That's why I give these talks. It's an educational theme and there's so many things involved. It's not a sound bite. You have to convince people that, that we are part of nature, that it's, it's essential. It's not optional to, to fight against. I mean, this goes back to, uh, um, Rachel Carson, who said, any war against nature is a war against our, ourselves. It's been a tough message to get across. Um, and I am, but, but today we have, we have tools that uh, we've never had in the past. And I'm looking at them with the, with the Heather Home announcement here. We've got Facebook, we've got Instagram, we've got ways of communicating with other people around the world instantaneously. Uh, millions and millions and millions of other people. So that's social media that I don't actually do, but um, most other people do do. And that gives us a very, very powerful tool, but we have to do it convincingly. Um, there are other, other uh, things that work really well. Be a good example. So if you have a piece of property, um, transform it, uh, do it in a socially acceptable way so that people walk by and say, wow, I want a property like that, not only because it's helping, helping our local ecosystems, but because it's beautiful. Uh, and stick a sign in it, stick a wild one sign in it, stick a, a National Wildlife Federation, put some kind of sign in there that says, this is what I'm doing. That's a wonderful form of, of advertisement for, um, for what you're doing. And it has been shown that works. People walk by and wonder what's going on here. And um, I can tell you that this is spreading. The message is spreading. Uh, I, you know, I've been talking about it for over 10 years now and uh, native plant sales are through the roof. More and more people are interested. Um, I can't keep up with requests to, to spread this, this knowledge. So I think we're reaching a threshold where it's, it's going to become the norm. I know that sounds far-fetched at this point, but we're getting there, we're getting there. And once we reach that threshold, people are gonna start doing it just because their neighbors are doing it and they'll look, they'll look crazy if they don't. We already see this with the, the uh, water shortages in the West. The person who has the big lawn that he's using sprinklers with is, is either fined or he's the, the, the neighborhood pariah because everybody knows we can't afford to waste water that way. Um, we, can, we can reach that with biodiversity as well. Exactly. And we're seeing that in the public garden realm as well. I mean, just about every public garden is, is really involved in the, the pollinator movement across the country. And we're seeing a, a big change in what our audiences are looking for as well. Here at Longwood, we have the meadow, we have Mount Cuba nearby that's doing the trials. Uh, there are an abundant uh, resource uh, for our community. So i um, glad to be part of that. And for those of you that are reading the journals, uh, we're also highlighting a different garden uh, public garden each journal. So last time we, we, we highlighted uh, North Carolina Botanical. So hopefully right. you guys get a chance to read that. We did have one question during the talk uh, that there was some clarification that Lily and Tracy wanted, and I know many others, uh, when you were talking about Desiree's work, they mm -hmm. wanted to know if you were talking about in the x-axis, the percentage of native plant composition by species diversity or if it was native versus non-native biomass? It's biomass. I'm sorry I didn't make that clear. It's the, the uh, amount of, of plant material. So if you had one giant oak on your property, it's one individual, one species, but it's a lot of biomass and it would, it would um, get you to that 70% compared to what else you have. So good question and, and I should have emphasized that. Thank you. Uh, question three is from Peggy, Peggy Menke in Missouri. And she said, it seems to me we need to maximize the opportunity to get kids involved when they're young so that we foster a lifelong connection to nature, perhaps by having plants and activities that are appealing to children. Do you have any suggestions for ways to engage the younger family members? Well, of course, the most obvious way to get them exposed to, to um, 
to nature and what's happening there and why we need it is through curricula at, at school. Uh, and I do see a lot of in, important uh, advances there, um, which mm -hmm. all stopped in March, but uh, presumably the kids will get back to school at some point and continue with that, that education. Uh, but kids' relationship with nature is formed by their parents. If a young child, even before they can talk, sees their mother scream when she sees a spider or stamp on an ant or, or you know, react negatively towards uh, any type of insect or the natural world. They remember that. That's a strong message that says, this is, is bad. On the other hand, if the mother picks up the caterpillar and says, what a great thing this is, they remember that as, as well. Um, you know, I've often talked about, send your kid out into your yard and say, find the cecropia moth even when the cecropia moth is not there because the adults only there maybe uh, at most a week, yeah. um, the caterpillar's there for maybe three weeks and then they spin a cocoon and it's there the rest of the year. Find the different life stages. If they find one of the giant silk moths, they'll never forget that. Right away, they're hooked. Kids inherently like those living things and it's only when we tell them that they're bad that they, they stop liking them. So encourage those types of activities. And this is where that homegrown national park idea comes in. This is what I'm talking about. Hunt those lizards, get them out so they can form their own relationship with anything that's living in, in your yard. They don't need parental supervision. As a matter of fact, don't give it to them. Let them discover it on their own because that's what they're going to remember. Exactly. Exactly. So thank you for your, your insight, Doug. And I uh, hope that it seems like many of you have kids uh, that are quite inquisitive. So uh, it, it's sparking that curiosity and encouraging it, like what Tracy's talking about on here and Kara, we uh, love to see it. Um, it's fantastic. And we also have the Seeds for Education program that's putting uh, native plants into gardens all across the country. We had another question from Susan in Texas. If we often attend events and functions with like-minded people that are already aware of the benefits of native plants, what could we do differently and what could be effective and ways of sharing the importance of native plants with the general public, our friends, our colleagues, and others that don't necessarily know all the benefits of native plants? Well, we talked about that a little bit about how to how to reach the um, you know, people who are not in the choir. <clears throat> I've had an idea. I don't think we've ever actually done it, but um, when I was actually giving talks, but it, it could work with these webinars as well. I call it a bring your neighbor night. So um, use your social capital to guilt one of your neighbors who would never ever uh, listen to something like this into into listening to it get see get they get the story uh, and see if it changes their mind i'd be really interested uh, because the non-choir is huge and and it's true if we simply wait for the people who are already interested it's gonna be a whole lot lot slower um totally agree yeah oh. again use that i don't know <laughs> yeah leveraging the social media. capital I mean, pretty <laughs> pictures pretty pictures go a long pretty, way pretty pictures yeah there you go <laughs> Uh, our, our last question is from Rita, and it is, how do you see the role of home landscape garden uh, evolving as a result of COVID-19? Uh, you know, I think it's gotten a, a tremendous boost. People are stuck at home. Uh, and after they, they watch, uh, you know, after they stream their favorite shows for the 10th time, yeah. they're starting to get a, a little bored. What do we do? Well, a lot of people are taking up gardening or, or taking up bird watching or starting to do things right at home that doesn't uh, involve uh, being in a crowd that otherwise wouldn't have done it. We also have saved a whole lot of time in transportation. So we're not sitting in our cars going anywhere anymore. And that gives us free time. We've got free time that we didn't have before. How do we use that? Uh, so uh, I, th I think the, the virus has given us a boost. boost. And a lot of people are getting hooked and that means they won't give it up once we, we come up with a vaccine. Uh, many people have talked about this. I sure hope it, it turns out that way, but that's the way it's looking. It's, it's been, a, been a boost. Definitely, and I've noticed a lot more people at native uh, or in um, natural areas and parks, uh, not just here in Chester County, but all across uh, the region where you're seeing people that have never really uh, experienced nature and doing it in new and exciting ways. I mean, this is now, uh, the best place to, to interact with your family and, and those that you're close with um, is getting out of nature and enjoying it for, for its bounty. 
So hopefully that that helps spread the word as well. And there was one really good point that someone said, and that is share the book. Uh, <laughs> well, there's a good point. Yeah, take the book and use it as a housewarming gift, which I thought was really a great way to get your your neighbors started, your friends started. Um, many people are going to gardening for the very first time, and it's a great way to, um, you know, help uh, help guide their decisions. So we wanted to thank you, Doug, for your for your time tonight and, and for your continued advocacy of, of uh, nature and having us all realize that we are nature's best hope. Uh, we Thanks want for the opportunity. Oh, definitely, definitely. It's always great to hear from you. And we also wanted to thank all of you for staying up late with us this evening uh, and for your membership in Wild Ones. And for those of you that aren't members, that might be the neighbor that was invited or the cousin or brother that's sitting alongside you right now, and you want to join Wild Ones, uh, please check out what we have to offer at wildones.org. I wanted to extend a special thanks to Susan Hall, who helped put this together and was answering your questions, multitasking behind the scenes to make tonight's event successful. And to also extend a thank you to the entire board at Wild Ones. We're really excited about what we've got coming up for you. Uh, as you can see here, Heather Holm is one of our newest honorary directors, part of that small group of visionaries that are changing the world one native plant at a time. And she is going to be joining us September 24th in the same format that we had today. And uh, we're really excited to welcome her. We also want to encourage you to take a look at what we've got going across the, across the country with Seeds for Education, with Wild for Monarchs, and check out our ongoing photography contest. We know that pretty pictures are one way that we can uh, convert others that weren't necessarily aware of the beauty of native plants. We hope to have you join us for another event. Thank you again, Doug, and everybody. Hope you have a great night. Thank you very much.